Hi, it's repair time, and we've got another bit of audio visual kit. Uh, instead of, uh, I think we had a Yamaha before, we had, I think probably had a couple of Yamahas. Anyway, this is an, uh, an Onkyo, uh, apparently, you know, quite a decent, uh, reputable brand. It's the TXSR607 for those playing along at home. And, well, you might be able to see the little standby LED there. It's on, and, well, that's supposed to be on. And it just uh, relays a click in. It's gone out of standby. Some relays click internally, but there's nothing on the display at all. It's one of those vacuum fluorescent uh, jobbies, but I can't see anything. And then you press the power button again, and the little tiny itty bitty standby LED comes on there. So I don't know if we've got a display fire. Given that uh, it does seem to come out of standby, or oh, I could I could physically, this is not feel a vision, but I could physically feel the transformer inside, big ass transformer vibrate. So you can feel the magnetizing current. So those relays will only come on, they're driven by like secondary side circuitry. So obviously some part of the secondary power supply works to actually be able to drive those relays, those like uh, soft start uh, relays and uh, things like that. So because you don't want uh, the speakers to go thump, like have a big whopping DC thump or something when uh, you switch it on. So usually they have like uh, relays that de-thump the speakers when you switch on and stuff like that so that all so it all seems kind of normal like three four seconds click then there's not yet then there's another click so that sounds pretty normal but units like this they have many different uh supply rails in them so it could be anything like the dis it might just be as simple as the display power supply or something but anyway let's crack it open take a look here we are i think this thing could do with a bit of a blowjob. Uh, it's, I'll take it out into the stairwell and uh, give it a good once over, but um, yeah, a very nicely uh, designed and laid out inside. And by the way, I checked, you can actually get this full service manual with schematics for this thing, and it is beautiful. Beautiful. So there's our massive transformer down there, high current power supply. Um, it's an absolute beast. Magnetic shielding around there. Yep, there we go, it's soldered there. So yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, magnetic shielded, couple of fuses down there. We'll check those. I can see some relays down there and everything. There's a uh, board here, which that just looks like a connection board going off to, yeah, some ribbon cables, which bugger off uh, down to the boards and stuff like that. So. Anyway, is that how they connect all the power via those ribbon cables? Maybe. Anyway, um, yeah, as I said, there's going to be many different uh, types of power supplies. And the main PCB down the bottom, that's all uh, single-sided jobby, not that double-sided rubbish. And uh, it looks like uh, these boards in here, these will be uh, driver transistor boards for the main um, MOSFETs, which or oh, could be BJTs, uh, for the main heatsink down here. So cause it looks like this board up the top here, that's just like uh, input uh, switching and stuff like that. So to get the main, is the main power supply down on the, could be down on the main board. So to get all that out, we're going to have to take everything out. But anyway, um, yeah, just like the, the cable ties and everything in here, the cable in, it's all very neat and tidy. I like it. There's a requisite backside for those playing along at home. It's got the, all the, you know, newfangled HDMI inputs and stuff like that. So it's reasonably modern. Um, anyway, our standby, our soft standby switch is actually on this board here, which then goes over, curiously, to the display board. So there's got to be power to the display board and going over here. And as I said, that is a, like, a lot soft logic switch, which then eventually, you know, powers relays um, down on the main board down here like we've seen before and maybe there's another no it's an input board uh yeah down on the main board and stuff like that so there's got to be like you know digital supply getting to the board here to the processor this is probably just the display processor itself the main processor is probably down on the main board here so it's got to be getting digital power to all that and then you know and coming back from this board so there's a lot of stuff which has to work in order for that soft power button to work. So that's rather interesting. So yeah, we could maybe be looking at just a uh, like display fault perhaps. Maybe I could like feed in an audio signal and see if something comes out 
Well, there's nice attention to detail. Look at that. They've gone to the effort to design two PCBs just to hold the temperature sensor to measure the heat sink there. One little board just to hold the screw and then which uh, presumably strapped down to the like the, the metal part, which then is uh, thermally coupled into the uh, TO92 plastic temperature sensor there. So, uh, yeah, but they've gone to quite a bit of effort just for that. Oh, there's the power tranny in the back there, and it's labelled collector base emitter. None of that gate rubbish. Actually, right off the bat, some of those solder joints on that uh, transformer PC interface PCB there, they look dry as a dead dingo's donger. So I think it's worth just taking, before we do anything, just taking one minute just to re-solder those. Ugh. That didn't help the display, but it made me feel better. Now, I've got it hooked up just to one speaker here, and if I turn it on, I don't know what channel I'm on, but if I turn the volume right up, I can hear your typical static at full volume on your speaker. So it's definitely working, it's doing something. I think if I put a uh, source into that, I think we might actually hear something. So I suspect it might be a display failure. Okay. Yep, uh, works a treat. It's got a thousand hours battery life. Beautiful. So I guess let that be a lesson to you. Uh, if you can check as much functionality as possible because, well, you know, look, you get nothing on display. You might think, okay, the power supplies failed, but then you realize, oh, it's doing the standby thing and I can hear relays clicking. You have a quick look inside and you can see that uh, the relay, that the soft logic button and the relays and everything is controlled by all the digital stuff and all that must be working. There's a lot of stuff that has to work in order just to um, have this uh, button actually turn this lead off and on and switch uh, some of the relays and stuff like that. So yeah, as it turns out, there's a good chance that everything else uh, seemed, I'm not going to say everything, but like I, I choose the aux input and it works and uh, audio works. So it's definitely worth double checking that before you chase a red herring down a bloody rabbit hole um, trying to like debug the power supply and stuff like that. Looks like there's probably nothing wrong with it. So uh, yeah, I'm going to look straight at the uh, display board now. So it had three screws on the bottom here and I removed the knob but and looks like this front fascia is going to lift out. Not without a fight but I think it's going to come out. There's probably some hooks on the top. No, just had to get my thumbs under the bottom and ta-da! There you go. That's actually aluminium uh, front uh, case on that. That's really nice. Brushed aluminium. And there you go. We can get in there. There's any, are there any screws? Oh yeah, there's a couple of deep screws in here. That should lift off because the board is screwed into the front and it doesn't make sense. If I was designing this, I would not design it so that you had to get all of this guts out, including the bottom board, before you could even access the screws that hold on that front panel board. It just makes absolutely no sense at all. You want this uh, to be like a finished assembly with the board in place, everything else, and then you can assemble that and test that on its own test station in the production line and things like that. So, yeah, that's... Is there another sneaky screw in there? There's actually another three sneaky buggers on the bottom. Now, does that... There we go. Now we're talking, oh, disconnect the HDMI. Show you this, there's just one little annoying ground lead right there. Get him off. That's just referencing the HDMI switching uh, board, which is down there, the HDMI, uh, re no, the HDMI receiver board, and then it transmits um, back through. But, oh, there we go. Oh, we've got the ribbon cable on the front over in that corner. And that's about it. Nice. They put tape there, holding that in place. Nice touch so it doesn't get pinched when you put the metal case on top. Always remember when you're designing stuff to tie your cables down and things like that. There you go. There's the entire front panel assembly. We can now work on that. Well, there's really not a lot going on here, is there? I mean, that looks like a single-sided jobby. Got one quad flat pack there. This is all wave solder, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, the solder feathing there, uh, when the big solder wave comes over it, that's to ensure that uh, you don't get any, like, uh, Klingons and stuff like that on your joints. Well, nothing worse than a bunch of Klingons. Klingons off the starboard bows. Klingons on the starboard bow, starboard bow, starboard bow. 
I have to pull a number off that, but yeah, it's probably a custom jobby. Um, it wouldn't surprise me at all. And there's a little bit of action happening down here. Uh, some discrete trannies and a little uh, eight pin SO there, but no, that's just uh, like the audio inputs that they were actually working. That was working fine. So that's probably like a you know JRC audio um, amp or something like that. So really, um, there's no power supply stuff on this at all. I'll flip it. I'll get the board out and flip it over. But um, I, we could have a uh, vacuum fluorescent uh, failure. So in that case, I mean, or if that's that chip, we're probably not going to get another one. I think we might be screwed. I'll show you the full schematic at the end of this, so stick around for that. But anyway, because uh, it is pretty fantastic. Anyway, um, here's our vacuum fluorescent uh, driver. It's the M66005, uh, and yes, it's obsolete, um, but you, know, you might be able to still get it somewhere. And that just dries our vacuum fluorescent uh, tube here. And there's not much else uh, surrounding that. Um, so yeah, there's not too much to go wrong. Now, interestingly, down here, this is where our... Um, standby switches on the front and the standby switch if uh, well the sorry the standby led actually if you follow the money it's not controlled via that uh, vacuum fluorescent chip it just goes straight back to the connector board over to here back to the main processor but curiously the reason I mentioned the chip is because this uh, zone led and this uh, pure audio led it looks like they're actually they do actually follow the money up here and these actually go into what well, looks like some digital I.O. of the vacuum fluorescent driver chip. So there, you know, you can send some data into the vacuum fluorescent driver and drive a couple of digital I.O. pins, which they're uh, conveniently using there to uh, to drive those LEDs on the front. But that's got nothing to do with what we're doing here. The standby switch, that's not controlled by that. That's actually going all the way back as well. So if you've got a failure on your vacuum fluorescent uh, display here, it's either the chip itself uh, or one of the, you know, like handful of uh, surrounding circuitry. Um, by the way, I think this... That is your receiver, and there's a little arrow coming in. That's your IR, that's your remote control IR receiver. So it makes sense to have it on the display board because it's got little front panel pokery out bits that can uh, see outside. But anyway, what we're interested in is the connector over here. Obviously, like, there's no blowholes in the chip. There's nothing physical that we can actually see. We've got various rails here. We've got plus 3.3. We've got plus 5 display. That's interesting. Plus 5 just for the plus 5 display. You want to be measuring that. And plus minus 15 volts as well. But the plus minus 15 volts, that looks like that just buggers off down to this um, setup. It's got a setup mic. You know, when you set up, because this is one of these newfangled surround sound uh, things, if you get a uh, calibration microphone, you can um, set it up. You put it in the middle of the room and it auto calibrates itself. They've got a dedicated uh, mic preamp for that. So that's interesting. But anyway, yeah, I'd be checking that plus five volt display and the plus 3.3 there, because if you can't get that, well, you're buggered. Good thing is we can just swing out this display and probe it right up its clacker while it's powered on. Brilliant. Thank you very much to the PCB layout person who thoughtfully provided um, the, the silkscreen overlay there for all the pinouts. So if you didn't have the schematic, you could go in there, check the rails. Beautiful. Lucky pin 13 is the 5 volts. Whoa, 4.78. But make sure I had the right ground point. This is digital ground. The relay's just clicked. That's interesting. Hello. Relays are clicking. Something's going on. I wasn't touching it, and the relays were clicking on me. Okay, let's try that again. I know that point there is digital ground, and that's 5. Oh, there we go. Yep. So the point I was measuring, uh, trap for young players, <laughs> buzz it out. Don't assume it's ground. Just for kicks, we'll measure those other power rails, plus minus 15. Yeah, they're good, but that's got nothing to do with the VFD. But it's always good to check power rails because it can be indicative of uh, something else because other rails could be derived from higher rails. So you never know. But in this case, not, because you wouldn't derive a 3.3 volt or 5 volt digital rail from a 15 volt analog. But, you know, yeah, the principle's there. 3.3 is 21. There you go, our 3.3 volt rail is good. So all our rails are good. So 
Uh, yeah, it's either the vacuum fluorescent display, the vacuum fluorescent display chips, or uh, one of the surrounding components or something like that. Or it could be something exotic like, I don't know, a front, like a, a solder joint cracked or something like that, or um, something, it's, you know, it's probably worth like a quick one minute visual inspection on the chip and whatnot and the other parts. But we're not done on our power supplies yet because vacuum fluorescent displays, think of them like well, they're vacuum tubes, it's in the name. They actually need a filament supply to work and they're usually the pins on the end of the display here. So if you want to actually uh, measure one, they're usually either, you know, on one end like that or across like that. So um, yeah, sure enough, look, there's two pins on this end shorted, two pins on this end, FL1, FL2, and if you follow the money, they actually um, are not generated by the chip here. Um, they actually go over to here on the connector and sure enough FL AC1 and AC2 pins 1 and 3 the filament AC supply there so we need to measure that so for this we use our special VFD mode on our multimeter <coughs> no that stands for variable frequency drive not vacuum fluorescent display oh anyway we are getting diddly squat on that so aha uh -huh. There's our culprit. We've found it. We're getting nothing on the filament for the vacuum fluorescent display. And, well, vacuum tubes and vacuum fluorescent displays don't work if you don't heat them up with the filament. That's what it's there for. They're vacuum tubes. So, yeah, no filament, no electrons. And it turns out that filament AC signal goes through uh, quite a few boards, as you uh, saw, you know, it goes into that uh, side uh, board and then goes into the main amplifier board and anything. But anyway, the uh, FLAC, I'm not sure if you can read that, but anyway, that basically goes from, you know, it just goes like through this board like this over here to another one and then another one and it eventually gets back to, um, <laughs> of course, the filament tap on the main transformer here. And that's the uh, board I uh, resoldered at the start. And you can see like there's a series resistor. There's, but uh, yeah, let's um, let's start right at the source and measure our AC. Cause I don't know, something might've happened to the wind in there. I'm sure the solder joint's okay, but you know, never know. It doesn't actually tell you what the filament voltage is, but a classic uh, valve filament voltage, 5.6 volts, five or six, and <laughs> 5.66, there you go. Um, so it's fine. Uh, does it get through that resistor there? Oh, 4.4. It drops on the other side of that resistor, so it must have some drop. Yeah, actually, there's 1.2 volt drop across that um, 8 ohm resistor there. Jeez. Sure enough, on that board, it's actually rated as a half watt resistor, so that uh, makes sense. You probably wouldn't use a half watt. You'd only use a quarter watt if there was, like, naff or current. So using a half watt for a reason there. It's obviously not open, but I'll just verify that that's 8.2. Nope, it's half that, but that is in circuit. Well, it turns out that I was actually measuring the wrong pins there. It uh, wasn't those ones on the end. It's actually this one over here. And I'll spare you all the footage that I shot of um, trying to <laughs> track that down. But anyway, it was really annoying. So it's actually here and here. There we go. 4.4 volts. Okay, so we have a filament voltage. Um, is it supposed to be that low? I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, so we've got ourselves our AC filament voltage there, so that's okay. So, uh, uh, what's left? Driver chip. Mm. Either that or the uh, magic smoke from the vacuum fluorescent displays escaped. Thou shall measure voltages, and well, <laughs> we have one more to measure. There's a plus 3.9 volt rail in there, which uh, that transistor there is doing something, but that is uh, VCC1 there for the uh, main driver chip. So if we're not getting 3.1, uh, 3.9 volts on there, where is that being derived from? Aha, uh -huh. it's being derived from the uh, AC supply here. So there's something wrong in there and we're not getting that 3.9 volts. Ah, uh -huh. gotcha. 
And it's that point in the video where I thought I was going insane. But no, it turns out Murphy has bitten us on the ass. Look at this. I was wondering why I was measuring, uh, like, you know, the, the voltages weren't off, and then I started them were off, and then I started to uh, check grounds going to the chip, and the grounds didn't match up, and everything. Like, over here on the schematic, pins. 19 and 20, right? I was using those as a ground, I was tracing that back as a ground reference, and I was wondering why 19 and 20 weren't shorted. Wah, 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 wah. Look at the silk screen. 19 and 20 over here are lead standby and key into. Um, it's 14 and 15. That actually ground. The schematic does not match the PCB. Yet, this is the schematic for this model number, but maybe they've got a different rev board or something. Unbelievable. Oh, I get it now. Look, pin 1 is pin 33 and vice versa. It's just upside down compared to the PCB. Oh, it's obvious I've got the Australian version of the schematic. Oh, the moral to that story is, like, when you notice something weird, follow it. Like, I noticed that, oh, okay, the voltage is, like, I wasn't getting the voltage I, I wanted, like I was measuring, there's another uh, uh, pin on the chip, which is uh, VP, and I was like, I was measuring that, and I wasn't getting it, I was trying to trace it back, because you need a ground reference, of course, to measure it, and I was choosing the connector over there, and it wasn't right, and then I thought, I did something, it started going down the rabbit hole, well, is this ground? Have I got a dry joint? Is there a bad link, or you know, in, in one of the links, because this is all uh, single-sided board, so there's all these links in there, it's got to jump, all the ground has to jump over, maybe one of those is bad, or something so I was following it back and I could not buzz the ground pin of this I ultimately went right I'm checking that the ground pin of this <laughs> goes over to the ground here and it didn't and then I kept following and then I realized don't the pin outs wrong so don't ignore that niggling feeling that something's up because well something could be up and something was up damn it okay I have determined a ground reference point here that's the ground of the chip I have determined that this point up here is the 3.9 volts of the... Uh, what do we get? 3.5. Ooh, is that near enough? Is that near enough? I don't know. Maybe I have to read the data sheet, but, you know, it's, it's good enough for Australia, surely. Well, no, it turns out that that uh, 3.9 volts there is not... Uh, generated from the uh, filament AC. It's actually generated from a Zener over here. Look, 3.9 volt Zener with an emitter follower there. All right, so let's actually check uh, this emitter follower circuit here. Uh, we're 5 volts in. We've already measured the 5 volts. We know that's okay. This is supposed to be, I don't quite understand this, it's supposed to be a 3.9 volt Zener there and it says that it's 3.9 volts on the output. Well, you're going to get your drop. You're going to get your PN drop in there. So I'm not sure what the deal is there. But anyway, let's measure that. Make sure we got that rail there. It's our 5 volts input, as we expect. And we're actually getting... That's the Zener voltage. That's uh, 4.2 instead of 3.9. So... I'm not sure why. Um, who knows? They might have changed the part. We might have an out-of-date schematic. Um, anyway, let's measure the 3.5. 3.5 volt rail instead of 3.9. Whether that makes a difference, I don't know. But that's kind of like the uh, drop you'd expect. It's not zero. So, I don't know. Is that good enough for Australia? Three and a half? Okay, so what I've done is I've uh, measured all the caps on there. I've made sure, like, there's no shorts anywhere. Everything looks fine. The diodes measure fine. Everything's hunky-dory. So next thing to do is check uh, that the chip's actually getting um, signals to it. And there's a couple of resistors down here. So on one side, there you go. That's some sort of clockety doodah. On the other side of the resistor, just to make sure it's not being loaded down. No, yeah, that's like data. That's data. That, yep, looks like data again. Yep, that looks good. And the other one's just a reset, and that's uh, permanently high. I believe that is correct, so it's not reset. So, chip's getting um, data, So, but it's not displaying anything. So is the 
whatever volts on the vacuum uh, filament too low? Is it the has the magic vacuum escaped uh, from the uh, vacuum fluorescent display? Is the chip otherwise somehow dead? Uh, the external components does that emit a follower circuit? Cause a is that causing an issue? I, I kind of expected it to at least do something. So I don't know. Well, the next thing we want to do is uh, there's another rail in here. That's the VP pin on here. And that comes from this diode circuit here, which taps off uh, the AC. It's a bit convoluted the way it's all drawn. You've got to follow it. But it basically um, it taps off the AC filament voltage. So, And you can see that that cap there goes down to that 3.9 volt rail and it's backwards. So, uh, so negatives over here, positives over here. So we expect uh, that VP rail to be negative uh, as opposed to compared to 3.9. And that I believe is going to be the, uh, the driver voltage for the vacuum fluorescent. So we should be able to see a negative voltage on there. So let's measure VP. Uh, it's 3.9 volts. Um, what the heck? The other side of the diode there, six volts. Um, okay. Okay, let's get the crow on that. And well, there's our filament voltage. Okay, so that's hunky dory. And the other side over here, well, wrong pin again. There we go. That's our filament voltage. So there is our, that's one side of the diode. That's the other side. I ain't seeing no negative voltage. So something's going on there. So what we're going to do is uh, check that zener in there. It's supposed to be an 8.2 volt zener. That's one way, 0.8, so regular diode drop. The other way, using 15 volt diode mode on the 121GW. There you go. Um, that's bang on. So nothing wrong with that zener. You can see those two resistors in there, 220 ohms each. So that's just feeding that. So we're supposed to get a negative voltage out of there. We're not. So um, I'm going to check those caps. Well, that 47 mic across the diode looks okay. And the other cap in there, that 10 mic, that's just fine as well. So yeah, what the problem is, is this uh, VP voltage here. It's supposed to be like significantly negative, i.e. tens of volts negative, like, you know, minus 40 volts or something. It's the uh, pull down voltage for the vacuum fluorescent tube. And we're only getting like positive two volts on there. That's all we're measuring. So everything else around here seems to be fine. So I can only assume, okay, it's going in there. That's 10K, that's high impedance. So it's nothing to do with that transistor there. It goes VP, does go over to here. There is a cap there. Oh, could that one be shorted? Oh, I might have to check that. Um, but it does go somewhere over to the connector. Why? Mm, don't know. Is it being generated over there? I thought it was generated here from the bit. Yeah, we don't have enough voltage there. Hmm, where's this going? I'm going to follow the money there. Well, yep. Um, oh, <laughs> if I actually engaged my brain, I would have known that, yes, that uh, negative VP voltage is like we should have checked that and we should have known it was negative and we should have like oh, could have saved a bit of time there anyway um yeah uh, this is actually on the uh video switch board so over here here you go there's our plus five so our plus five volt display we've actually yeah we've got that no problems whatsoever but the negative vp there is actually, it's generated down here. There you go. There's a 30-something volt Zener. And there you go. It's supposed to be negative VP. It's actually uh, marked as minus 35 volts. So we're clearly not getting that. That's why it ain't working. So now, believe it or not, we're actually going back to the uh, transformer tap board over here. And I've measured it um, because that VP comes from a separate tap. It's a 39 volt. I'm measuring 39 volts uh, AC on there. So anyway, we have to get to the video switching board, which is now under here. And that's like really annoying. Like, <laughs> Why couldn't they have put this stuff on the actual uh, display board itself? Uh, his bloody moldy board designs just put stuff around willy nilly. Ugh. I, oh, that's a standoff post. There we go. There you go. There's a ribbon cable there. Now access that video switching board down there. 
which has our uh, negative VP generator on it. And here's where it starts becoming a gigantic pain in the ass, because here's our negative uh, VP here. This comes from our AC tap down here, and uh, this stuff here is unfortunately on the bottom of this board down here. We don't have easy access anymore. There it is there. We're looking at uh, Zenodiode, 36 volt Zenodiode uh, 9005 and 9001 down there. There's 9005 down there. This is the bottom side, the solder inside of the board. But we can actually access uh, 9001. That's actually on the top side. That's, I think, those three pins in there. So that's a TO92. And But basically, yeah, um, we're getting... Like, it was easy before. We could measure this thing all powered up and everything's hunky-dory. But now... It's integrated with this sideboard over here and it's all interconnected and oh, it's just no I think the only way to get this board out because it's got like you can't just lift it out because uh, It's connected the right angle into this board which is then connected down there and it's got its own standoffs and everything else I think we have to get this back panel off pull this off and hopefully these boards that uh, connect into the speaker jacks there because, like, I can't, yeah, you can't get those out or can't, oh, no, yeah, I have to, no, I probably, yeah, I have to unscrew all those, unscrew the entire back panel, and hopefully the back panel comes off, and then we can pull this board out and then up. Ugh. Okay, I think I got every screw out, and then I had to take the mains cord grommet out. Hey, there we go. That's actually very nice how that pulls out there. Now that board's just flapping around in the breeze now. They're all just flapping around in the breeze. But yeah, I should be able to pull that off now and access my surface mount parts on the bottom. Unbelievable. Yeah, there we go. We can now access the stuff on the bottom. But uh, yeah, I don't see how we're going... Like, we probably can't just power this up on its own because uh, then you don't have the connections through to the front panel and the soft power switch and all that. Although I think by default it does power on. Um, so maybe we don't need that anyway and these ribbon cables too You can't just pull them out. They've actually got like a locking mechanism on the side of these So you can't just can't just whip them out. But anyway, ugh. so I might have to bring the soldering iron to the job now Unfortunately, it doesn't look like we can power this thing up externally. There's just too many um, interconnected boards and everything. I mean, I'm just measuring like the basic 12 volt rail coming out of the tap there and uh, it ain't working. So yeah, I can't just like power this thing up and probe around and everything. Maybe I could hack the soft start circuitry to make it actually switch on and make it work, but oh jeez, it's getting messy now. Anyway, um, yeah, the, <laughs> the problem here is that we don't have our negative 35 volt rail and I did find it's on one of the actually the only place it's the voltage is ever marked for our negative VP is on the uh, overlay for one of the PCBs one of the PCBs that it passes through it's got minus 35 volts on it so it should be at that and that's the only rail that we don't have so Unfortunately, like I've tested the uh, diode in here. I've tested the transistor. Uh, well, it's, you know, as far as I can without taking out a circuit. They all seem okay. So I'm not sure what the heck's going on. Hmm. And sure enough, that uh, 2SC2235 transistor tests okay, at least at a basic level in a tester like this. Doesn't mean there's not some high voltage breakdown or some other, you know, aspect to it, but it's a transistory. So, uh, as far as this video is concerned, um, it... <laughs> It's a bit of a diminishing returns. I mentioned this on Twitter. Um, doesn't mean I'm not going to fix it. It just means the effort required to go through. It's going to take many, many more hours, probably, to dick around with this thing to try and uh, get to the bottom of this. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm, I'm calling it quits for this video. Um, so consider this a part one. We've found the fault, but it's just not easy to test and get back up and running that's all so uh, yeah i'm just gonna leave it here for the time being i need to get on with other stuff sorry if you don't like these repair videos that you know oh dave only release the video when you finish the repair what are you hopeless or something oh look you know <laughs>
Come on, this is just ridiculous. Anyway, um, I hope this video was interesting enough. So I'm going to leave it there for the part one. I think we got to an interesting point where we've uh, discovered what's actually wrong with this thing. It's just a matter of fixing it. And with all the paths that uh, going through all the different boards on this, it, it really is a pain in the butt. And just not being able to power it up is just really annoying. And oh, God. Anyway. Uh, I've had enough for part one. Catch you next time.